In the previous episode, Murphy, the guy with no manners, spat into the water bottle, which the woman unknowingly drank. It was indeed a bit disgusting. However, Murphy did this to experiment with his supernatural abilities. Taking advantage of the kidnapper's distraction, Murphy extends his right hand, mimicking holding a gun, and slowly lifts it. Airily, Janice uncontrollably mimics the same motion, but she soon came to her senses. Janice didn't know what was going on and thought she was in a trance. Murphy stands up and concentrates, sending a signal for Janice to fire the gun. As the thought arises, Janice's right hand uncontrollably begins to rise. Doc and the others heard the shots. They don't know what happened, but it guides them in the direction of the rescue, seeing his plan succeed. Murphy quickly takes Janice's handgun, but Henry, thinking Murphy is trying to escape, rushes over to wrestle for the gun. At this time, Zimmerman, who went out to scout, heard the gunshot and rushed back. He was very angry and asked what was going on. Janice, as if possessed, surprisingly defends Murphy. Zimmerman stops the argument and tells them to follow him. They must get the drugs from Mesa before dark. Murphy's gunshot was to signal Squad X's location, and now he deliberately leaves his jacket behind. Roberta and the others, hearing the gunshot, indeed head in that direction and soon reach Zimmerman's parked car. The road is blocked, so they're forced to stop. Upon inspecting, they find no one in the car. Roberta tries to open the door to move the car but triggers the trap. Zimmerman naturally heard it but didn't care. Whoever triggered the mechanism would attract the zombies. However, he didn't expect it to be X-Team. Although zombies swarm them, the squad, armed, handles them with little difficulty and clears them out in a few minutes. They continue along the road and soon find Murphy's jacket, confirming he was indeed kidnapped. After traveling 5 kilometers, Zimmerman stops. Just over the hill is the pharmaceutical factory. They prepare to rest and recover to ensure victory in their upcoming operation. Henry and Janice, without wasting time, sit down to drink water and replenish their strength. Murphy approaches, looking down at Henry with a condescending attitude. Initially, Henry doesn't care, but gradually, his consciousness seems to slip away, and he begins to pass the water to Murphy. At this time, Zimmerman spoke up and interrupted this weird scene. They finally crest the hill and see the so-called Mesa Pharmaceutical Factory below. Inside the fence are numerous zombies, some having ingested stimulants, moving incredibly fast and, in their frenzy, even devouring each other. Murphy is apprehensive. Regular zombies don't attack him, but these seem mutated or evolved, and he's genuinely scared. He outright refused to enter the pharmacy. Zimmerman, of course, disagrees and shoves Murphy against a tree. As Zimmerman starts to utter a threat, Murphy bites his arm, leaving a bloody tooth mark. Zimmerman, enraged, draws a handgun and aims it at Murphy's head. At that moment, Janice beside him gets excited, claiming she has seen her husband. Zimmerman tells her to shut up. Though gunpoint, Murphy appears calm, as if everything is under his control. He doesn't resist further and agrees to go in and steal the drugs. Three minutes later, they approach the main gate. Zimmerman says, we'll distract the zombies. Then it's your turn. Go straight to the farthest door inside. Find the power switch and turn it on. On the second floor of the warehouse is an air raid alarm control, activated to attract the zombies, allowing a safe entry. After that, Zimmerman and Henry will go to the side of the door to attract the zombies. Murphy took this opportunity to walk behind Janice and said, with her mental state fragile, she's more susceptible to control. Holding her pistol, she's ready to take out Zimmerman. Murphy opens the gate and enters. The zombies glance at him but quickly avert their gaze. This means that no matter how much these zombies have mutated, they will treat Murphy as one of their own kind or even as a higher level being. But he didn't dare to be careless. He still slowly advanced step by step for fear of making a big noise. After all, he had just seen these zombies eating even their own kind. Soon, Murphy reaches the door Zimmerman described. He gently pushes it open and steps inside. Relieved by the silence, following the route, he heads right, finds an iron cage, and sees the power switch inside. The junior zombies clear a path for him, and one even seems to hint at the switch's location when he struggles to find it. As he flips the switch, the lights immediately come on. Upon reaching the warehouse, Murphy finds it filled with unopened drugs. He climbs the metal stairs to the second floor, where the air raid alarm switch and a computer are located. He quickly sits down, turns on the computer, and activates the air raid alarm. The alarm's blaring draws the zombies towards the sound. Zimmerman is pleased, assuming Murphy has succeeded. They walked inside with a sense of excitement. Murphy, 
Meanwhile, uses the computer to open a wireless channel and call Citizen Z at the North Pole Station. He didn't want to ask for help, but wanted to ask Citizen Z if there was any sign of DR merch, the woman who had injected him with the virus, and he wanted to settle the score with her. Citizen Z finds it strange. There's no trace of merch in California. The last record shows merch was in Komodo State and then lost contact. At this moment, Zimmerman and his group arrive, exclaiming in excitement at the sight of the drugs. Murphy, already annoyed at not finding merch and irritated by the trio's loudness, picks up a set of car keys from the table and turns off the outside broadcast. The sudden silence causes the zombies to scatter and charge towards the warehouse. Murphy walked down the stairs with a grimace on his face. Zimmerman, indifferent to Murphy's mood, orders him to help with the drugs. Roberta and her team sneak in, guns pointed at Zimmerman's group. Zimmerman refuses to lower his gun, aware of Murphy's importance. Amid the standoff, zombies enter, Henry is tackled before he can react. Roberta and the others had to deal with the zombies first, but fortunately the doorway was narrow and almost every zombie that came in was eliminated. Janice looks for an opportunity to attack but hesitates upon seeing her husband turn zombie. The result was predictable. Five minutes later, Squad X's bullets run out, and they resort to close combat with melee weapons, quickly eliminating the zombies. Zimmerman saw that the tide had turned, but he didn't panic. As long as Murphy was in his hands, he would survive. Murphy closes his eyes, and suddenly, Zimmerman's mind goes blank, his arms going limp. At this moment, Murphy was so handsome, and at the same time, he also made them feel strange, as if this person had changed a lot, and vaguely gave them a sense of oppression. Until Murphy threw the car keys over to them, they felt back to reality. The crisis is averted, but Cassandra's leg wound, aggravated by the ordeal, looks grim. Murphy's personality seems altered, exuding an air of authority. Fortunately, he still identifies with his friends Roberta and Doc and agrees with the mission to save the world. His only grievance remains with Dr. Merch, the one who injected him with the virus, and his desire for revenge. However, Citizen Z's investigation reveals that Dr. Merch hadn't gone to California a year ago but was last seen in Komodo State, and then she vanished without a trace. That's strange. If she didn't go to California, why did she ask the X-Team to send Murphy to California? There must be some secret in between. To uncover the truth, Citizen Z hacks into Merch's database. It shows that Merch was a genetic engineering prodigy, becoming an expert at a young age and even inventing a unique gene splicing technique. Strangely, she disappeared two years before the apocalypse, as if evaporated into thin air. It wasn't until three years later, after the zombie virus outbreak, that she reappeared in a New York infectious disease lab, where she injected Murphy with the virus vaccine two years ago. After leaving for California in a helicopter, she was never heard from again. Let's make a bold assumption, DR Merch might be involved in this global catastrophe. For years before the virus outbreak, a bald man walks the streets of New York, looking every bit the benevolent uncle in his suit and smile. Soon, a man named Johnny approaches him. Johnny gets a high-paying private job on the internet where he is asked to meet a doctor at this traffic light and take him to a drug addict that no one cares about. They cross several blocks to a derelict residential building, a gathering place for addicts. Bill, lying in the room, is an orphan who, due to drug abuse, has his body covered in sores and is now merely awaiting death. Corian is pleased and hands Johnny a small bag of drugs as payment, signaling him to leave quickly. Once the door is shut, Corian, who had appeared kind, kneels beside the bed and pulls out a syringe filled with crimson liquid from his bag. He injects it into Bill's arm, although unclear what it is. The effects are immediate. Bill convulses and groans. Corian is not a doctor. His sole purpose is to experiment on living humans. Neglected addicts like Bill are perfect subjects. Seeing that the injected stuff had almost kicked in Corian used a 20 centimeter long syringe to insert it through Bill's nostrils and then drew out some samples. Afterwards, Corian calmly leaves, as if he had only completed a trivial task. Johnny, who had left earlier, is found dead in the hallway. Obviously silenced, all signs point to the mysterious man conducting unknown experiments. Not only that, but in the second year, Corian traveled to the Ebola quarantine zone in Africa. He entered a ward where a young boy infected with Ebola was lying in bed. In the third year, Corian traveled to an abandoned deepening laboratory in Kazakhstan and was met by a local middle-aged man. Like Johnny before, this man assisted Corian in finding subjects for his experiments. However, they found the person already dead. 
Unusable for the experiment, since the man didn't honor his agreement, Corian didn't play by the rules either, he first cut the man's gas mask and then crushed a biohazard reagent on the floor, the man immediately struggled to breathe, collapsing and coughing up black blood, he became Corian's new specimen extractor, in the third year, Corian visited a small village in Africa, there was a peculiar patient who, since an injury, became like a vegetative person, oddly, he obeyed commands, leading some to jokingly call him a zombie, while Corian appeared calm, he was internally thrilled by this effect, exactly what he sought, he even tested with sharp objects, and the man indeed felt no pain, this led to a speculation that Corian was attempting to create a new type of virus, he traveled worldwide, collecting various specimens to combine with DR, Murch's exclusive gene splicing technique. This explains Murch's disappearance for several years before the apocalypse. Unexpectedly, they created a global zombie virus. Realizing he had committed a colossal mistake, Murch began desperately seeking a solution, leading to the experiments in New York using Murphy and others. All of this became a historical mystery, with citizens the only uncovering some basic information about Murch. So, who exactly is Corian? And what was his purpose in creating the virus?